Welcome back to the Space Alvi Institute podcast. I'm Andrew Pettiprin with Bobby Mixa. Bobby, how are you? Good, Andrew. Uh, really excited about this uh, conversation with Nathan because, you know, we're both cinephiles. So super excited to talk about movies, especially uh, European films. Yeah, well, any day where I get to talk to my friends about movies is a good day. And uh, uh, all the more so because we get to talk to the aforementioned Nathan. That's Nathan Douglas, who is a writer and filmmaker in Vancouver, British Columbia, Canada. And uh, just an all around great guy, very knowledgeable about film. And we're excited to talk to Nathan today about Eric Romare, who is one of my very favorite filmmakers. And um, I think... Uh, an important figure in uh, kind of modern European culture and somebody that um, I think is, uh, you know, somebody that we want to introduce more people to. So uh, welcome, Nathan. How are you? Thanks, guys. Uh, it's great to be here. I've really enjoyed listening to the show, um, you know, since you guys started uh, not too long ago and really excited about what you guys are doing with with the Institute. So and uh, I get to talk about Eric Romer, who is um, on most days, I would say, my favorite filmmaker. He shares that spot with Terrence Malick, so it's kind of a back and forth. But we'll say uh, he's probably my favorite deceased filmmaker. We'll say that. But it's an absolute joy to to get to do that. So thank you for, for having me on. Yeah, well, we, uh, we're really excited to do that. And maybe we'll just go ahead and, and jump right in. We don't want to spend maybe too much time on the the ins and outs of the biography of Romare. I'd love to get into his films and stuff like that. But I do think it's important that we set the stage a little bit. And maybe you could tell us just um, just somewhat briefly, who was Eric Romare? What was his kind of formation like? And, and why did he sort of come to be the filmmaker that we now consider to be a pretty important character? Yeah, uh, that's a great question. There is, there's, there's, there's almost too much to say. So, so I'll just condense as as much as as possible. But basically, the first thing maybe to know about Eric Romare is that Eric Romare is not his real name. Uh, his actual name was uh, Maurice Scarer. Apologies to our French listeners if I'm mispronouncing that. Um, and he came from a uh, middle class family in uh, central France. Uh, was born in around 1920, I believe. Um, and grew up this kind of, uh, very ordinary, um, you know, uh, middle-class French upbringing, Catholic, very, very Catholic, um, very morally upright from what we understand. And, uh, he was a, uh, a very, uh, intellectual, um, you know, child from what we understand or a very intellectual young man, um, wanted to be a teacher, uh, loved the classics, uh, had a very, you know, uh, solid education in you know classical art. Um, one way to think of him is someone who fell deeply in love with the the 18th century uh, you know artists and thinkers. Um, he's very much kind of a, a, a man of the Enlightenment, but not necessarily all the the ways that that might imply, especially uh, um, in in you know more negative ways that that Catholics tend to view the Enlightenment. Certainly with the arts, you know, he was someone who was steeped in the classics of the Enlightenment era, the French, the great French playwrights, you know. Um, people like uh, Molière and uh, uh, Corneille, and I'm um, you know missing a number, a bunch of other names. But he had this. I guess the way to summarize is that he had this very French, <laughs> you know, culturally French uh, foundation. You know, he's kind of as French as it gets. Um, but his his part of that as well, though, is is his Catholicism and and something that you know he grew up with and as far as we know retained until the end of his life um, as as a practicing Catholic. And I think well, I'm sure we'll unpack that as we as we go along. Maybe the last thing I'll just mention is once we get you know as as he's he he's a young man, he wants to be a teacher. Um, he sort of sees teaching as his first vocation, but he also has a great love of literature. And so in the 1940s, he published a, a novel uh, with a, a fairly prestigious um, French publisher, and the novel was a complete failure. Uh, and it's interesting to think about the ways that that life goes and and even just the way that you know God will move someone's path through you know life as we I think we can all know through different different um, maybe failures that have happened that you know the path uh, goes in a, a better direction and we can definitely see that in the life of Eric Romare he wanted to be a novelist and instead um, he was moved onto the path of being a filmmaker through so many kind of events you know you look back with the eyes of Providence and you see wow this is incredible um, and the way in which that really started to happen was 
in the late 1940s. Uh, he got really involved with the cinephile clubs, the, the cine clubs, all the the films that were being, you know, rushing back into Parisian theaters uh, after World War II, after the occupation. A lot of American films came flooding into uh, French theaters, uh, which, you know, they were held off, but they were, you know, blocked by the Germans for the years of, of the occupation. So all this classic Hollywood uh, cinema, and then also, of course, the great jewels of of pre, pre-war pre French cinema are, are being re- rewatched. And there was just this f- incredible fusion of cinematic culture happening in, uh, in France right after the war. And Eric Romare kind of comes into that and is one of these figures, he, he's one of these, these cinephiles who starts, he falls in love with the movies, he starts writing about it, he starts thinking about it, he starts working uh, as a critic, but he also starts trying to make films. And you know, from that point, that's maybe the best way to think of him moving for the rest of his life. You know, he is kind of in these this dual vocation, in a sense, of both a theorist and as a filmmaker. But the lines are not clearly demarcated. You know, they you can sort of if you, if you read him as a theorist and you and you watch his films, you're not going to see a um, clean kind of uh, explication of his themes. You're going to see this kind of back and forth. It's like kind of almost one one project in a sense. Um, but anyway, just, yeah. So, so maybe the way, best way to summarize it is he's a, he's a man of the arts, you know, his, his, his artistic background is of the classics. It's about bringing what is, uh, traditional and what is, you know, great in, in the canon kind of into a, a modern mode. Uh, and then of course he's, uh, someone deeply, deeply informed by the Catholic faith. And, um, so, you know, as, again, as far as we know, he, uh, live that out, and and I, I would say you can definitely see it in his works um, going forward. That the, the the presence of his faith is inseparable from his work, even when the faith is not explicitly to do with the work. So uh, that's kind of like a snapshot. There's a lot more that could be said, but I hope that hope that gives a bit of context. Yeah, no, that's great, um, Nathan. I'm as I told you before, I'm not as familiar with Romer as you and Andrew are. Um, but like the little that I'm, I'm actually a little interested. I'm, I mean, I've seen a couple scenes from, I think a winter's Tale and mm-hmm. some of the other stuff watching a little bit from my, my night at mods, but I'm really interested in, you mentioned his, when those Hollywood films were coming back into the cinemas in France, um, and reading some of the European critiques, like intellectual critiques of Hollywood, uh, whether that's coming from like the Frankfurt School or some other uh, French or some some French intellectuals, um, what was the the response of people like uh, Eric Romare to those critiques, um, and what did they see in cinema that maybe could be something like true art? Yeah, it's a it's such a great question. The what they saw was something real they they saw something something touched them deeply and and when you know this is the question of kind of uh, the meaning of the term cinephile which is which is a french originating term it comes from doesn't come precisely from this era that we're talking about it, it was already kind of around before that but it definitely found its its identity as a term from this period from this activity of these kind of uh younger you know these particular individuals a lot of them are students um and what they are discovering is they're 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 being moved by what they're seeing. They're seeing these films that are these you know these objets maudits or these these bad objects, these kind of uh, un un you know untouchable films in a sense, according to the the French kind of um, literati. And they're discovering that something something here is really is really touching us. Um, and so the whole kind of um, criticism that comes out of that is an attempt um, to really discover the roots of that. It's a philosophical um, exercise. And maybe something that's also important to mention that this is going, you know, part, partly what is animating this quest is, um, is the rise of existentialism as a, you know, as a philosophical movement in France, you know, um, which only really starts to get going, you know, again, around, around the end of the war and, and going into the 1950s. And so a lot of these, um, these cinephiles are, influenced by people like like Sartre and and also in the case of Romer and and or not so much Romer but figures who were friends with Romer the people like Andre Bazin uh, a great you know uh, film critic um worth his own discussion someday uh who 
you know, they were he he and Romero were good friends, and and they were kind of fellow soldiers in the quest to uncover the meaning of film as an art that is about reality, is an art that is in deep relationship with reality, and is is meant in a sense. Um, I'm not don't want to put words in their mouths because I don't think they ever said it exactly like this, but really their whole quest is about kind of uncovering uh, film as something that you know is to. Uh, is to express the relationship of man to, to what is real. Um, and so, yeah, basically the, um, these films, these Hollywood films, uh, I guess you could say like they, they, they wanted to push back against the un- unjust, what they saw as unjust criticism or, or maybe blind kind of uh, rejection. Um, they were seeing something special in these works and they were trying to understand why that was, and then out of that, this kind of critical school uh, develops, and and you know polemics developed, and they start to to really defend that, um, and it becomes a major wedge within the French film discourse. By the time you get to the 1950s, um, you know one of the most significant members of this kind of critical school, Francois Truffaut, who you know we know would would go on to be one of the first filmmakers of the French New Wave. Uh, he wrote a, a very divisive essay that was kind of targeting the the official French film industry. You know, the the, the historical films they're making the, these very literary these films that are adapted from very literary sources, um, very tasteful. The, the way I'd compare what I'd compare them to today is uh, the kind of like the mid the middle brow or the mid the mid range kind of like film for you know adults that everyone says doesn't exist, but it, it does exist. It just ended up, it's entirely on streaming platforms now. Like, you know, half the movies on, on Amazon or Netflix or Apple or whatever are now these, these middle brow kind of like, Hey, in our case, it's the bio- biography of the product or the biography of the, of the founder or whatever, where it's like, Hey, do you want to know who, uh, who invented a Seagate hard drive? Like mm-hmm. here's the story. And, um, you know, we're going to put it, we're gonna make a 12 episode. Uh, we're gonna make a six episode series and put it on Amazon and, and uh, like that's kind of the equivalent, I would say, of it's this it's this kind of like meaningless content that's kind of like tastefully made, and it's you know it looks professional, and it's kind of you know it, it works. It's a it's a it's a boat that floats, you know. But there's nothing particularly special about it. Um, Truffaut was taking aim at 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 these you know these kinds of films and these the filmmakers who are kind of enabling this, and so um, that's something to to keep in mind is that in these newer films that are in these, these Hollywood films, these kind of like lower class films that are coming into, into France, they're seeing something real. They're seeing something potent. They're seeing something sharp that is really cutting to the soul. And then their, all their efforts are to kind of understand what, what that is, what's going on there. Yeah. And gosh, I mean, we could, we could just go so far just talking about the whole French new wave movement and, and, and all of that. And, I mean, one sort of important detail maybe is that Romer was the editor of the Cahiers du Cinéma, which was the, for a period of time anyway, which was kind of the, the publication of the French New Wave and, um, you know, made great contributions there to, in a sense, like kind of curating the the movement, um, even while he's kind of learning the craft and beginning to make films. And maybe this is the moment where we can transition to talk about his his early films. Um you know, like to pick up on what you were saying, Nathan, I mean, his movies with maybe one or two exceptions are really not about anybody, right? I mean, they're just about just ordinary people not doing anything particularly important. In fact, I mean, he has multiple films that revolve around the dilemma of what to do on your holidays, right? I mean, he, he, is, he is making movies that are in a sense literally about nothing, but they are so captivating just as, you know, as you say, human beings engaging with reality. And he gets his start with these with these six movies that are called the six moral tales. And maybe I'll just briefly describe the first one, and then you can just take it from there if you want to say more about the the, the importance of these films. So the first one is a short film called The Bakery Girl of Monceau from 1962. I'm right about that, right? That's the first one. Uh, yes, uh, the first the moral okay. tales. Yeah. Yeah. So he, he did make one... a film before that. There was there was the the feature film oh. he made before that that did not succeed. There's a bunch of failures, that's, us, but that's the sign of Leo, right? That's Is right. That the first yeah, one. Yeah. 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 Well, so the Baker girl of Monso. So it's about this man who is studying for exams and he's wandering around Paris, just like sort of 
you know, killing time to study. And he bumps into this woman that he's totally captivated by and believes deep down that this is the woman for him. But then she disappears. And so he wanders around the city every night looking for her in the same neighborhood. But meanwhile, he meets this girl who works in this cookie shop where he likes to go and eat a cookie as like a cheap dinner every night. And his mind sort of like, like makes him kind of think, well, maybe... Well, I, you know, I feel like I'm in love with this other woman, but I don't know where she is. So maybe I'll just be in love with this one instead, you know? And it's like such a great dilemma of human of being a human being, right? Where it's sort of like, what what do I think is right? What do I think is right for me versus what is right in front of me? How do I process all this stuff? In a sense, all of all of Romare's movies wrestle with this kind of thing but particularly the the six moral tales so i don't know maybe just take it from there nathan and tell us about that or, or go wherever you like you can go beyond the six moral tales as well and just kind of give us a sense of like the kind of moral vision that romare is trying to show us yeah i think the, um there's again there's there's too much that can be said we don't we don't we sadly don't have time to go into all of it but one thing that really leaps out for me is uh, the moral tales are are somewhat famously again. We were talking about him as a as a as a novelist. He wanted to write novels. The moral tales all began as novels, ideas for novels. Um, and when that didn't pan out, he was able to re, kind of re rework them as films. And then you know we have the the wonderful result from that. Um, but what's really interesting about the the moral tales is you can sort of see him really starting to to work work out his influences and then, and also kind of work out what maybe what he thought his first calling was again, to be a novelist in cinematic form. And so you have these very, they are very literary works in the sense that they're, they're off about these protagonists who are kind of very internalized. Uh, they often have voiceover that are, uh, you know, is, is the character voicing his inner thoughts to the audience, um, to a North American audience that, that is, you know, sees voiceover as kind of a cheesy thing. Certainly this is been my case in the past you know with watching films it's taken me a long time to appreciate the value of a of a well a well modulated voiceover um it's something that i think romare you know is a master at in these films but it can take some getting adjusted to uh but the the films are these they're very literary objects you know you kind of read them as you watch them not only because you as a, as a non you know french speaker for the you know those of us in, in north america mostly uh you're reading the subtitles um you know, it's it's a very it's a very kind of internalized experience, and so we're going through each of these films is is about a man who is kind of torn between two women, or you know, he might be in uh, married or engaged. In most cases, he's like engaged or in a serious relationship with another woman, and someone else comes along to kind of test his his resolve, his faithfulness. Um, and they're they they tend to be these very gentle, uh, mostly comedic, you know, in in the classic sense. Um, uh, explorations of of really of man's fickleness. You know, each of the characters, the male protagonists in his films, they're you know they're all quite different. And but what they have in common is they all are very fickle, and they're all kind of caught up in the snare of of um, kind of being too inside their brains, um, too caught up with like being unable to choose or being unsure or you know again very very relatable you know. Uh, human experiences, as, as you were saying, Andrew. Um, maybe the last thing I'll just know: one, they're wonderful films, and and for years they have been the ones that are most well known of Romare, which I find really interesting because I, I, I guess you do see this with the French New Wave. You know, all the major French New Wave um, filmmakers: uh, Truffaut, Godard, um, Chabrol, Romare, and uh, Jacques Rivette. You know, their films from the beginning, from the, the proper period of the New Wave, say like from the late 1950s into the, up, up until about 68, 1968, um, you know, those are the films that are most well known. But all of these filmmakers had incredible careers after 68. Um, and what's interesting about Romare is, uh, I would say his his for me, his most, um, his best work comes after this period as well. But what's wonderful about these films is they're, 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 they're all, they're all delightful. They're all worth seeing. And they're, they provide a wonderful entry point. What, what I hope, um, people who want to explore Romare would do is they, they'd start there and then they would keep going. Cause what you see with his career is like the, the moral tales are the blueprint. It's him 
kind of learning, okay, this is, this is how I take what I wanted to do and I'm going to make films out of them. And, but as time goes on and the, and those films are very successful. They were very successful in France. They're very successful, you know, outside of France. They, they made his name as a filmmaker. He was kind of fascinating about him is he didn't stay there. He didn't stop at just making more moral tales. Uh, he he moved into something else. He started to go into history in the 1970s. He made these films that are very much um, about hit, you know, kind of uh, adaptations of, of historical literature. Uh, in the 1980s, he starts to get even more kind of improvis improvisatory, excuse me, improvisatory uh, in some senses. Um, basically, like the blueprint kind of gets less and less of a blueprint, and it's become he becomes more of a filmmaker who is really uh, in the sense of a you know as as all master artists do you know he doesn't need the rules um, you know he doesn't need the training wheels, and so you start to see especially in his work in the 1980s this incredibly you know supple reflexive kind of way of filmmaking that is is very modest and very um almost nondescript in some ways like it's certainly not something that would catch the eye of the average american viewer uh who's used to hollywood you know spectacle and intensity um but you know there's absolutely incredible treasures in in those films and he keeps he keeps that going to the end of his career you know he he died in uh, 2010 um making you know he's kind of zigzags along and 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 it never quite stays with the same thing so the moral tales are such a wonderful starting point because they they exude his his intelligence his heart and also his his catholicity like you know his the 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 um the truths of the faith are animating all of these films you know because they're really at their heart they're all about like are you really going to kind of fulfill you know your calling in life like are you going to be an authentic person uh who is who is you know dedicated to the truth and is is like you know living in a living a, a, a truthful good life um you know that that's a great starting point but he those things kind of uh echo down through the ages in in, in the rest of his films so i don't know if that is that kind of does that kind of help andrew or is that uh, yeah there's always I think more really, where that came from so yeah that's really helpful yeah you, you were mentioning i don't want to get too far away from romare but um as you were talking about his kind of little bit more of an experimental phase and leaving behind the blueprint. I mean, uh, eventually, I, I seem to bring up Terrence Malick an awful lot, but I want to just like okay. maybe ask you about maybe actually the, the influence of the French New Wave on even people like, um, say, some of my favorite directors like Terrence Malick, uh, some Polish directors like Leszek Kolkowski, um, I know he was in France there for a little bit. Uh, not so sure, though, about the, the influence of the French New Wave on him. But this this kind of, you mentioned existentialism. Um, I mean, right now I'm actually reading some of uh, uh, Kierkegaard's um, The Sickness Unto Death, a Christian uh, psychological exposition for upbuilding and awakening, which is all, by the way, viewers, uh, you know, with the theme of hope. And then also despair. This is all covered here, and it's quite profound. But you know, this kind of Kierkegaard's influence on, say, some uh, you know, as a Christian um, existential personalist, however you want to describe him, and then influencing people maybe who've left behind the Christianity, but still are going to make play a major role in 20th century uh, philosophy. Um, which maybe it's the question of how much they've actually taken from Christianity and just secularized it like a Heidegger. Um, but then somebody like Malik, who goes out and perhaps I'm not even sure if he met, I think he perhaps maybe even met Heidegger, but he definitely wrote and even translated. I actually have a, the translated version of uh, mm. his uh, book on, I think it's like something on re uh, reasons, but one of Heidegger's uh, books uh, mm -hmm. that Malik did, but also talking about failures along the way and then being slowly like going from trying to be like a, a philosophy teacher to then being a failed journalist to then mm -hmm. finding his way into film. Um, uh, so what is what is the influence of the new wave air Cromer on some of these great these great um, if you want to call them existentialist filmmakers like Terrence Malik? Yeah, that's a great question. I honestly don't. I I I 
would I've never come across anything that suggests Romare or the French New Wave was a huge influence on Malik, but we can always obviously the 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 influence of the French New Wave on film culture in general is is so generally right. massive, in the sense that um, certainly it certainly had an effect on you know American filmmakers, and and I, I I'm sure you know I'd love to someday meet Malik and, and actually ask him this. Um, but uh, I think what's really interesting to think about is what the French New Wave really proved to film history in general is the um, the personal is is the heart. Like the personal is the heart of of filmmaking. It's like any any of the arts of the beautiful. Uh, you know, it's uh, and this is something, of course, that that um, Pope Saint John Paul II gets into in, in the letter to artists, which you know is thankfully being assimilated more and more into into north american catholic thought especially with artists these days um the person the primacy of the person like the personal element in in art you know does exist in filmmaking and that was the discovery of the you know the the filmmakers who went on or the really the critics who began went on to become filmmakers in the french new wave um it's just as an aside it's the the historical like uh, treatment of them is that they were critics first and then they became filmmakers. But the truth is actually they were all kind of making films as they were doing their criticism. It's just the films were, they, they were trying things and, and, you know, going down dead ends and, and it was their, their film school basically. But it's, it's interesting to think uh, very few of these filmmakers are kind of like they're, they're doing it all theory and then they switch, you know, into practice. It's like, no, they're doing theory and practice as they go, you know, mm-hmm. um, which is really, I think crucial to understand how they ended up revitalizing things. But, the witness of the French New Wave is this at the heart of it, and this is an aspect that the um, film historians, uh, I think, have been reluctant to really pursue, especially after uh, the late 1960s, um, when trends in you know academia moved away from kind of uh, realist philosophical uh, principles. We might say um, that the 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 heart of the New Wave really comes from a fundamentally Christian. Uh, posture and a fundamentally Christian impulse. And it's an assimilation of the existentialist desire to kind of get down to the roots of things or to kind of really penetrate, you know, what are we really, what is really going on? What are we really here for? That's the question that these, uh, the filmmakers of the new wave were really asking in the 1950s. They're asking this about film. Why is this, what is so, what's the big deal about film? Why is it so, why does it seem to cut into the very like, just cut so deeply in the human psyche. Like what is going on with that? Um, and it was honestly, it was, uh, again, we've already mentioned Andre Bazin briefly. He was, uh, uh, um, I, don't know, I, th- I think more of a nominal Catholic. I, I'm not hundred percent sure about how sincerely he practiced the faith though. He did, we know he, he, you know, he died with, with all the sacraments. Um, uh, but it, with him and Romare, Romare, they were the kind of these two, kind of a tag team of really presenting a a robust intellectual Catholic view of the cinema and really trying to assimilate what they're experiencing in those terms. And this is something that's been kind of forgotten or, or at least kind of has been much more of a sidebar in academic film theory in, in, you know, it's kind of secular film theory um, for, for many decades. It's, it's seen, it was seen as an embarrassment for many years Um especially with regards to Bazin, who holds such an incredible, he, he holds a pride of place as being considered by many as like the Aristotle of, of film criticism because he the kind of questions that he would ask in his, in his film criticism. Um, but anyway, just to kind of bring things back into, into focus, uh, there, the, the whole kind of uh, influence of Christian personalism on these thinkers and on, you know, French Catholic culture in the, in the 1940s, that has a, that, that is a major influence on the new wave, even though it's not super obvious, I would say it's something that kind of has to be dug up and studied more. Um, but, but you see it in, in Romero's films, a film like, um, uh, my night at mods, which is a, a 1969 film about a Catholic man who's going through this classic, it's one of the moral tales, you know, so he's torn between two women. He sees a woman at mass. Uh, he kind of falls in love with her um, and follows her through the streets and, and, you know, tries to, you know, find out who she is. Uh, and then he ends up invited to a friend's house, a friend of a friend. There's a, a beautiful woman there um, and she's a divorcee and she's very secular and, and not Catholic at all. And they have this lot, they have this 
he kind of falls for her too. So it's like, he's kind of in this, this, this position of, do I go with the good Catholic girl or do I go with the kind of the more interesting, uh, you know, uh, non-Catholic, you know, secular woman. Um, and then the rest of the film is kind of blurring, you know, basically questioning those, those categories and question those lines of, you know, who, you know, um, uh, but basically like what the reality is never as, as simple as, as it appears. Um, that's a film that on the surface is extremely recognizable to Catholics as, you know, as a kind of a film for us. Like it's about a Catholic guy. He goes to mass. Like there's these, at least two major scenes in the film that take place at mass uh, for, for significant chunks of the mass, you know, where you're basically there from like the, our, in the, uh, from the, our father to like the, to communion kind of thing. So in this film that has uh, an incredible, you know, it's, it's on the surface. It's, it's a very Catholic movie. It's got a, uh, you know, Catholic signifiers, aesthetics, and, and it is a, you know, it's very, it's very easy to access. It's very easy to enter into as, as a Catholic viewer. Um, I think it'd be a shame if people saw that and they, that was their only, that was kind of where their understanding of Romero as a Catholic artist kind of ends because really the principles that, that him and others were exploring through their critical work and then through their filmmaking in the new wave goes much deeper than that. And it's really about getting to the essence of the thing. It's getting to the essence of uh, film's ability to bring us into deeper contact with reality. Um, this idea that, that film has the means to uh, not only just to, you know, to be a kind of a wonderful vehicle for the imagination to express itself, which is kind of how we see things in, in uh, North American culture and Hollywood, especially, you know, Hollywood is the dream factory. This idea that that film is a, is a medium for taking kind of what's imagined, what's wonderful about the imagination, what we're imagining and putting that kind of into a, giving it a kind of concrete reality. Uh, this is kind of coming at it from the other side, which is saying, no, no, no. Reality itself uh, is um, well, obviously it's, 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 it's the impetus for, you know, for all, um, inspiration obviously like you know it only has that because uh you know god is is the ground of being you know but it's it's uh reality is this doorway to to god basically you know it's a very sacramental view um and and so the film trying to make films that that engage that relationship that are not and, and by that in terms of pra in, in concrete terms like that means more you know not so much uh like you're trying to force something into being as you kind of are required to do when you take an, a, an idea and you try to just, you know, realize it um, kind of out of nothing or the way Hollywood does it. We see this more and more with, um, you know, special effects and everything and green screens and what's called the volume. The thing they shot the the new star Wars shows on that, the room that's basically just screens that, you know, they light the set. Uh, because they're they're gigantic LED <laughs> screens, so they light it realistically, but like essentially they're just in a box that you know has has flat backgrounds and things. Um, there's you know it's there there isn't this tangibility, there isn't this this contact with with the real, and so uh, the the new wave, like the the best way to I think to understand the new wave is it's 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 a desire for that contact it's a desire to more closely reestablish contact with the real and that's part part of what i mentioned francois Truffaut's critique of the french film industry earlier like that's partly what he was working out of which is you know these films that were that that's that that serve as the kind of like the standard fare that we have to that we get to to watch you know it's not it's not really in contact with reality and that's not to say that they're they're worthless because you know there, there's many great films in that in, you know, in that air, in that body of work that he was critiquing, but we need something more, you know, we can't just be satisfied with kind of the plastic surface aesthetics that we get in like a really well done movie, you know, that like a visual, like a visually well done movie is a wonderful thing, but you know, we need more, you know, and a lot of people, I think, especially in, in, uh, influenced by Hollywood, they'll, they'll interpret that, um, as, well, we need a better story. You know, we need more story. And I would say, no, no, the, the, the witness of the new wave is actually has nothing to do with story. It's not about story. It's about the personal and about experiencing the, the greatness, the beauty, the truth, the goodness of the moment that God has given us. And that can happen in obviously so many, so many different, different contexts and, and ways of experience, uh, experiencing that 
film gives us an ability to experience that, to experience moments, um, and then to kind of uh, uh, respond, you know, to to God who's who's giving that to us. And so the the I'll just try to cap off this thought by saying uh, the great thing about the new wave. Here's the thing: new waves are always going to happen. And and the French new wave is not the only new wave that has happened. You know, we can point to other examples. There's the one of my favorites would be the the Taiwanese new wave in Taiwanese cinema in the early 1980s up into the 90s. You have incredible filmmakers like Ho Shao Shen and Edward Yang um, making uh, incredible films about kind of like real society, things that are happening in people's lives. And and it's there's a similar drive there to come into contact with the real so i think the thing to, to maybe emphasize is like the french new wave is significant and we call it you know we associate all new waves with the french new wave because that was kind of the first one to really articulate this desire in this way but it's important to say it's really a universal principle like new waves in art and especially in film are always going to be happening they're always going to happen uh you know whenever things get too stale <laughs> um but you know the question is uh, that, that can go in, in negative directions as well too you know as, as we know with with um efforts to reform throughout history so uh there yeah there's there's a lot uh so i would say that the, the new wave is extremely influential you know in these general ways but in in terms of um specifically on on specific filmmakers that's kind of something more to be looked at in the in the the films they make someone like george lucas you can look at a film like american graffiti you can see the influence of the french new wave there like it's this it's a film without a plot it's just like people hanging out you know I don't, have you guys seen it have you guys seen this movie? oh yes 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 okay I, I think it's amazing that's my favorite film my favorite american film of the 1970s um i prefer it to star wars like which you know maybe sounds like oh whatever but i mean star wars is amazing obviously but that is such a beautiful film it captures such a moment um that movie is impossible without the french new wave like you mm -hmm. don't get that that film without being able to see what the french are doing 10 years earlier and say wow you can actually make a movie about people just kind of like hanging out and just being and just just being themselves or just talking or you know and it's it's like but but here's the thing actually that whole idea of like, can you make a movie out of people just hanging out? You know, uh, it was, it was classic Hollywood that kind of like told the French cinephiles that was possible. Mm -hmm. So and the great example would be someone like How Howard Hawks, you know, is like famous, uh, great American studio filmmaker. He makes films that are just people chat hanging out. And this observation, you know, um, I think was originating with, um, I think it was Tarantino or somebody in the nineties who was really talking about, hangout cinema you know like like can you make a you know the, the 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 wonderful joy of a film like rio bravo or something where not much happens people are just chilling dudes rock you know and then and then the, the gunfight happens the big the big you know the plot happens um but that's that's something that I, I mentioned that to say like there's this there's this cycle there's this incredible kind of like you know relationship between hollywood and other film cultures where there's this fertilization that happens and you know it kind of just kind of keeps going you know so like yeah i don't know i could go on forever about yeah. this so it's uh yeah it's an amazing um spectacle yeah i really i really love the way you set all of that up nathan and you know just to kind of um to carry forward the idea of what romare is doing kind of philosophically and theologically in his films like so in the six moral tales you've got this one really famous film, My Night at Mods, that's very self-consciously philosophical and theological. I mean, like there are these long conversations. I mean, maybe the, you know, the, the kind of central scene, right, is this long conversation about Pascal and about Pascal's wager. And um, so this man, this very heady man, this intellectual man is kind of both kind of living out this intellectual dilemma and also kind of talking about it to us as the viewers while we're kind of journeying with him, right? Mm -hmm. And then you have that kind of recapitulate in a way in a movie like um, A Tale of Winter, only there you have the intellectuals in that movie, mainly this this guy Loic, is is kind of, he's the faithful Catholic, but he's not 
really that appealing. I mean, he, you know, mm. he's like, I keep in the scenes that he's in, I'm always like looking, he, he even says something like, I don't believe in miracles. He's like a very weird kind of Catholic, right? He has um, to be convinced to go to like his Sunday mass to make his obligation. <laughs> right. You know? She Well, right. So Felicity, <laughs> his girlfriend is the one who says like, look, I mean, the church bells are ringing. Don't you need to go to mass? And he's sort of like, oh yeah, I guess I need to, you know, I mean, yeah, I watching so. him on the screen is like, I, I'm always like trying to look behind him and see if he's got like Hans Kung and Ronner and stuff like on his bookshelf. Right? Yeah, yeah, totally. Um, yeah, yeah. Yeah. Whereas she, this Felice, she says at some point, like, I religion and I don't get along or whatever. And yet she's the one who like goes and prays in this chapel in Nevers where St. Bernadette's body is. And she she's the one who basically has this like overwhelming sense of God's providence. Like she's the one who's so open to God's grace, right? All this kind of thing, right? So I just I love the way Romare does that, where he's like you know, he has certain films that are very kind of self-consciously philosophical and theological and the protagonists kind of embody that. A another example of that would be the character of Jean in the um, the uh, autumn, uh, spring, spring, tale of spring, right? She's a philosophy mm -hmm. teacher and, you know, the opening shot is of these philosophy books on her shelf. And so she's like wrestling with philosophy and her life at the same time, right? Mm -hmm. But then we, so take all of that for pontificate on any of that that you want that I'm bloviating about. But but I, I wanna I wanna land on another film, which is The Green Ray, which is another film that I know you you like very much and I love I love very much. That's a great one where you have a character who is not a philosopher, not a theologian at all, but who is like deeply longing for reality, right? And Mm -hmm. kind of finds it i think you know but it's a oh, weird yeah. journey that we make with her right so i don't know maybe just yeah. take take that and, and and take us a little further with kind of romare's kind of philosophical and theological vision yeah maybe what leaps out to me is in the moral tales again um they're very literary works they're very kind of planned out you know like the the, the they're schematic in in a way um we get from a to b this is kind of what we learn this is what the character goes through like everything's very very laid out again like like a novel um i think over time you know he romare certainly once he'd got that out of his system he started to loosen up he started to realize you know he started to really embrace film as as a flexible medium um as a flexible medium for storytelling but again not limiting it to storytelling um but you know as as basically again his whole approach is he, he's really looking at it's a way to encounter the reality of of yeah, of, of the way human beings are. Um, there was a quote I came across yesterday when I was I was preparing for, from an interview he did in 1974, and uh, I think the interviewer was basically asking him like, "Why don't you keep doing moral tales?" You know, because by this point the the cycle had concluded with his with his uh, with his last film, Love Love in the Afternoon, uh, of that of that group, and he was kind of saying, you know, no, like I want to be in contact i want to he explicitly says in the in the his answer like i want to remain close to reality i want to remain close to what's happening um and so the way that we see that play out through the the 1980s and in the 90s when when uh, tale you know tale of winter and and tale of springtime are being made um is his way of making uh again it's it's, it's not it's not so much about okay here's the plan and we're just going to execute it he starts to do some really incredible things um, as a collaborator where he's, he's cultivating the circle of actors, uh, around his office, you know, his office was apparently just like, uh, always bustling with, with, um, particularly with young women and, you know, you know, these young, young actors, young actresses who knew his work and wanted to work with him. Uh, and he was kind of famous actually for, uh, you know, especially in, in French culture for, uh, being able to kind of carry on, um, like chaste, chaste friendships with these women. Um, as far as we know, so far, no biographical details have ever come out that that he was anything but chaste. And he was even quoted by a, a friend who asked him once, how do you do it? Like, how can you surround yourself, you know, in your 50s with all these gorgeous women? And his response uh, with a, a bit of a smile was uh, absolute chastity is, is what he responded with. Mm -hmm. um, uh, now, I just mentioned all that in the sense that biographically, he was a very secretive man. Um, but his family also gave all of his documents after his death to to um, to a public archive, and and so uh, I think if if something sorted had gone on, I think we would have found out by now. Um, but uh, basically, he cultivated this this incredible circle of actors and, and actresses. He's always talking with them. He's always having tea with them. He's listening to how they talk. He's he's he he starts to write his his dialogue. 
uh, he'll, he'll record his conversations. He starts recording his conversations with his actors, uh, hearing how they speak, the intonations, the word choices, and he starts to match his dialogue. He starts to change his dialogue of whatever he's writing at that moment to be more natural in coming out of the mouths of, of his actresses and his actors um, so that when it really finally it's time to shoot, it's like it's theirs to begin with. You know, it's not kind of the classic model of uh, here's the script, just follow us on the script, you know, and like, woe will betide you if you, if you do, if you don't, or there's a certain sense as well. You see this with like people like John Cassavetes and the, the, the more like kind of improvisation schools that other come up in Hollywood acting in, in the sixties uh, and seventies, there's kind of an opposite um, extremity that, uh, you know, where it's, it's like no script whatsoever. And let's just completely like, you know, you can sort of see the, the, I don't know that personally, I'm not a big fan of it. It has its merits. There's, there's, there's positive things about it. But uh, when you can see an actor like scraping to kind of like get what, you know, try to, he's like, you know, he's scraping like a blind man to like find the essence of the scene. I, personally, I don't think it's, it's uh, producing great art. Um, Romero's kind of in the middle of that. So he's, he's really in this incredible process of, of refining as he's in relationship with all these wonderful artists uh, and the films are the outflow of that. And so I think that's the kind of progression we see in his in his career. Um, I think also that that there's a there's a cor there's a corollary. I'm not enough of a philosopher to to like use the term, probably. but basically like like with the character of Loic, like to go from the protagonist of My Night and Mods is this very intellectual, you know, Catholic man. Uh, by the time we get 30 years, uh, 20 years later to Tale of Winter, that character is now a supporting character who's kind of a bit of like a, a goofy guy. I think mm -hmm. there's a progression there of wisdom in Romero's sense in that he's really seeing, okay, so the people who are really searching, you know, it's not just about like having the right credentials, obviously. It's not just about having the, um, even the right, uh, you know, the, the right trappings. I mean, we all know this, this is, this is obvious, but he sees in a character like Felicity, he's looking for that authentic search. So the characters that he's, he's developing in the 1980s, especially, uh, are all kind of on these quests and they're not particularly religious people. Like none of the, mm -hmm. none of the characters in his, films really after um after my night my night at mods we make an exception for for uh, percival the galois which is set you know in in middle ages in the um everyone's everyone's religious in that <laughs> uh but after that point he's not making really religious characters but they're all on religious quests and this is the thing that's incredible about his work is that he has a, he found a he i don't want to say he found a way cuz i i suppose he did but um basically he he got to the point as an artist where he was so in tune with his own gifts and his own, um, I think even just the willingness to embrace those limitations, the limitations of them that he was able to produce these, these works that are, again, are very modest in scale, very modest in ambition, but they, they all reach deep into the soul. You mentioned, uh, the green ray, Le, Le Vert, which is, I just watched it last night again to get in the headspace for this, this talk. So I'm really glad you brought it up. Um, Again, a very a non-religious character who's on a religious quest. Uh, she's she's dissatisfied with with she doesn't even know what she's she's, she's she just gets upset all the time and she she's trying to have a great vacation. <laughs> it's like the whole plot of the film is I need to have a, I need to have my vacation. It's July and August. Uh, I'm not I'm not having a good time. I can't go with you know the guy who's was her boyfriend. You know, and they they broke up a while ago, but she hasn't quite accepted it. You know, it's like she can't go do anything with him. She doesn't want to go with her family to Ireland. Uh, she tries to go with some friends to Cherbourg, um, in the north. To I think it's in the north. To you know, have like a, a classic Normandy kind of uh, vacation. Doesn't really work out. She's not satisfied. She ends up going to the south of France to Biarritz. You know, to the um, much more sun drenched. Uh, and and still isn't really happy there you know and, and it's it's just like such a um anyway yeah it's 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 a it's a religious quest and then the way that romare kind of brings this uh together is you know she comes in to discover someone mentions to her uh jules Ver jules verne's book the green ray uh about the phenomenon when the sun sets uh over the ocean if you look closely uh, you know, many have, have recorded this phenomenon where right as the last ray of the sun is about to depart 
a green flash can be visible. And it's this incredible natural phenomenon that happens. Well, there's a character in the film, uh, an old scientist who um, Romare brings in to kind of like explain the science behind this, you know, why the the rays of the earth are, or the rays of the sun are kind of like affected by the curvature of the earth and so on and so forth. Um, but uh, this character gets caught up with, oh, like, you know, the, the, the green ray kind of becomes her, her, um, it becomes her quest to, to, to see the green ray. Uh, and, and so anyway, I, I don't want to ruin the film for, for anyone who hasn't seen it. I highly recommend people watch it. Um, uh, with the caveat that there, you know, there, there's a scene set at a French beach. So that means there, there is some, a little, a little bit of, uh, beach nudity there. Um, but it's a, it's an incredible, uh, quest into the, uh, into the, the, the use of a natural phenomenon which is beautiful. You know, there's, there's a spectacular aspect to it of, of this, this, this colorful event, um, you know, becomes like, it is a metaphor. You could say it's a metaphor for her search for God. But I think the thing that, that sets it apart from other films that would approach the same thing is it's not only a metaphor. And the thing is that like, like Romer takes it on its own merits as, as a beautiful event, as a beautiful natural phenomenon. But then that's not the thing. Like the thing about Romare, he he truly is uh, his Catholic ethos is most visible in that he never stops at the significance of one layer, you know. And the thing is that he never is trying to like rub your face in the significance of one layer or another. It's really about letting the significance of multiple layers of significance operate at the same time and touch the soul in different ways. And that's what we see in the Green Ray, where this natural phenomenon you know, is a metaphor for her, her quest for like fulfillment as a human being. She's not happy. She wants to be fulfilled. She's looking for God. And so, you know, there's that layer of it. What happens when, you know, if she actually sees that phenomenon, what does that mean? But then it's a beautiful phenomenon, you know? Um, I don't know. And there's other, other layers to it as well, but that's, that's the thing that, that I would hope, especially since we're, you know, part of, part of what you guys are doing with, with space Alvi and, 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 um, looking at the influence of like European culture, what can that offer? What can European Christian culture offer to North America? This is an area that as a filmmaker in North America, I think there's a huge gap uh, in North American culture to be comfortable with multiple layers of significance, to be comfortable with things signifying multiple things on different levels and just letting that, letting that wash over you, letting that, letting yourself experience that and not have like a clean uh moral or takeaway or just just something that like for the intellect to, to glom onto it's like this is what's desperately needed in uh particularly in catholic like for catholics making films making media you know we have a, a such a strong reliance on the the left brain kind of mode of interacting with with the world it's like we're, we, we as you know despite having you know, the, the truth of the faith and, and the, the tradition and just everything that the, the church has given us over 2000 years, we, uh, especially in North American culture, have this deep un discomfort, I think, with actually sitting with something uh, in a right brain method, in right brain way or in a, a poetic way, and just letting it sink in. And Romare is the filmmaker for that. Like Romare is the filmmaker of letting you kind of just receive reality, receive things, receive multiple layers of significance and just let it sink in. And the more that you experience that, the more you want to see more of his films. And if you see all his films, then you have a wonderful experience of an incredible artist. Um, but anyway, that's, that's uh, yeah, like he, he is, this is why I'm, I'm convinced and I'm, I'm glad we get to talk, chat about him because I think he is the, the filmmaker. He is, or he's a filmmaker who has so much to offer uh, you know, it's the gifts that he brings, which could only come from the particularities of like European Christianity, uh, are exactly what we need in, you know, on our continent, um, and in the arts that, in the art that we're making. You know, Nathan, as you were talking, I was thinking about, um, somebody that Andrew and I, um, used to talk about an awful lot, uh, Luigi Giussani. Remember, mm -hmm. Andrew, when you started reading Giussani and, you know, the line, like, reality, reality. Um, but, you know, so much of Giussani is also connected to, you know, the work of Hans Van Balthazar, 
and the, you know, the glory of the Lord and beholding the form. And there's a certain sense in which, you know, there's, um, you, you said this kind of reception of reality, the fullness of reality that we're all longing for ultimately in like the beatific vision. Um, but if there's something comfortable, like you have to be comfortable with things first, where it's mm -hmm. like, you know, it, it seems to me that, you know, partially what European film, at least what I like some of the best films that I've seen, there's a, there's like a way of seeing things, but at first there has to be this kind of like truly comfort in the human condition uh, of our, even our messiness, but let, receiving the kind of various lights or different revelations that may come in the kind of uh, day to day uh, in something like a conversation. So, I mean, it, it, it maybe in your in your article in, in Dapple Things, you talk about the kind of like uh, the um, beholding things and and the con con contemplation of reality. You mentioned Yosef Pieper in that article, um, and you know, I have a nice kind of corrective too to maybe saying that he should have watched maybe or stuck around a little bit more to watch some of these great European films. But um, it seems to me that like what I love about European cinema, but also just like the European sensibility is this somewhat of a comfort just with the, like you said, the, um, the, the human condition and not feeling like we have to get to the moral message where it's like, I, I watch a lot of these, you know, Christian films coming out of North America today. And it just seems like you said, they're just focusing on one one layer of significance or you feel like it's it's meant to the director is trying to bring you to some message um or or some takeaway and i i always feel like um in some ways kind of being manipulated um and also it just not being true not having much of a depth but could you maybe say something about like the, that depth that you find um in 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 european cinema yeah, absolutely. The I, I, well, I think there's absolutely there is a depth, and uh, I'll say what I think is really is really positive, and then I'll, I'll throw in a caveat as well. But um, basically, the depth. I mean, it's it's hard to put into words. I think for sure, as a North American, um, uh, and you, you know, there is a lack. I th there's a lack of rootedness you know this isn't I th it's interesting that a lot of i think there's been a lot of discourse about this you know in in our lifetime um looking at uh north america as and, and i would speak from a specifically from a canadian context because like the history of canada and and the u.s is similar in a lot of ways and then obviously quite different um but like my ancestors came to canada you know during the most of them came over during the potato famine uh from ireland and and settled in southwestern ontario um at least from from you know my father's side of the family um and so it's interesting to think that you know in terms of rootedness a lot of uh uh like canada is a very young country um what we lack in comparison to someone to a country like the united states is a strong kind of identity separate from the the nation that first really established us and you see this both in in like france in, in, both in french canadian and, and in anglo-canadian cultures where the influence of britain obviously on the anglo-canadian culture is extremely still visible in just how we do everything um and the influence uh you know, french canadian culture of course is its own culture really within the, the wider context of canada um so i think there's a real like hunger i would say for you know historical roots but also roots of identity that that just go into the mists of, of history in a way that is not possible for descendants of of you know uh the colonizers in in north america and and so something about european obviously european culture in general and and just the fact that that you know as pope benedict was speaking about a lot in his papacy about like Europe as a Christian Europe is a like the identity of Europe as we know it is Christian. It's fundamentally Christian. The idea that Christianity formed Europe. Um, in some ways that can be said about Canada, you know, that can be said about the U S too. And, uh, you know, and, and it's, but, but it's still not the same. 
like you know there is there's like so i guess i guess maybe the way i'd put it is like there's an assimilation like in terms of that depth there is there's an assimilation of the truths of the faith at such a deep cultural level that is is so kind of natural you know that it's there's something very comforting about it to encounter it it's as a maturity maybe you might say um there's less like you know we see the same thing with with growing up out of out of adolescence into adulthood where the older you get the less you kind of well hopefully the less you'll freak out about you know things you know the less you'll freak out about about particular details or things that don't go right or you know whatever there's different marks of it um but i think you see that there's a there's kind of a mature sense uh in the great uh european films that deal with christianity uh, on the flip side, though, of course, as we all know, there is there is also that like the risk of apathy and the risk of things like you know not really being taken to heart. And I think you can see a lot. Of, there's a lot of. I'm personally not familiar with with a lot of these films, but I think there's a lot of films in European culture that do express that, and you know, in all sorts of ways. So I think just to maybe try to bring this down, land this this plane of thought is, um. You know what? It's really hard to put into words. Yeah, as to say, there's there's a deep longing, <laughs> there's a deep longing to be to be rooted in the things that most matter, um, and something about European culture really speaks to that. Now, on the flip side, this is the thing. I don't know if you guys, are, I'd be curious to hear what, what it's like for you guys when, and especially for you, Bobby, like having moved to to a European country. Whenever I'm in Europe, like I love it. You know, it's amazing, but I always miss. I always miss Vancouver. I miss Canada. You know, I miss Ontario, which is where I grew up. Like I miss Canadian culture. Um, and it, and it's, I'm always very aware as much as I love being in, in France or Italy, uh, this isn't home as much as I love being in a Gothic cathedral, you know, in France, this isn't home. Uh, and I've never quite been able, I mean, it's, it's always been very comforting to, to, to realize, okay, like, you know, I am in a particular place at a particular time for, you know, particular reason. Um, but it is always also kind of puzzling because the, when you're back in North America, that longing, <laughs> uh, the city that I'm in, uh, Vancouver has a lot going for it, but one thing it doesn't have is a plethora of beautiful churches. It's a very, very young city. So most of our churches are made in modern, um, styles and some of them work and some of them don't. That's all I'll say. Um, but it's, it's like, so I guess something about maybe the the these films that we're talking about, they fill some of that need. Now I want to make the the caveat I wanted to mention is obviously speaking in such broad categories, you know, I know it's it's quite, you know, reductive. Um and I think we need to make maybe a bit more room for kind of the unique ways in which particular uh like like European Christianity is not just a a block. You know, it's like there's there's like the films we see coming out of the French Christian personalist ethos is what, you know, ultimately we get, that's how we get an Eric Romare, you know, that's very different from what we saw coming out of Italy. And, but, but at the same time, we see something different. We see something similar in the sense that someone like Armando Olmi, uh, faithful practicing Catholic his whole life makes an amazing film. He makes amazing films from the, you know, 1960s, um, up until his death, not too, uh, which was a few years ago. Um, Similar thing. You can see similar uh, desire for real, desire for the real. You know, a film that Olmi made, like the Tree of Wooden Clogs, which I don't know if you guys have, have seen, but I, see, I think you've seen it, Andrew. Is that right? Or Yeah, funnily enough, I haven't seen it, even though it is one of the, the films on the Vatican film list and therefore a chapter in a book that I co-authored. But yeah, okay. uh, so no, I need to. All I'll say is just that it's 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 full of that 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 it's grasping for the real, you know, it's trying to, and, and, and in a, in a, in a mundane way, in a humble way, it's not trying to, uh, it's not a spectacle. It's, it's, it's just, so anyway, there, there's, you know, we could use other examples. I'm sure in Poland, uh, I'm, for, I'm not as familiar with Polish cinema, Bobby, um, as you are, but I'm sure there's examples in, in Polish cinema that, um, you know, that speak to this as well, where, uh, the, the, the particular gifts that each national culture in Europe brings uh, both their particular, both, both the interpretation of the faith through that, through that. And then the films that come out of that, like they all have something to offer. Um, and it's not just kind of like European film as, as a whole. Um, 
And I would love to see something like that happen. This is the thing, like in, in North America, you know, I, I think we're at the start of uh, something is happening, you know, in terms of, of obviously there's a lot of, apost- there's a lot of uh, flourishing of apostolates. Um, there's a lot of consciousness raising around the, the meaning of art and, and uh, particularly of film is starting to really kind of like, feels like something sleeping is really starting to, to come awake. Um, it'd be, it, what I really hope to see is something, you know, basically to see that diversity of that. It's not just all one interpretation. It's not just all one way of making a Catholic film or, or whatever. It's like, no, no, no. Like these things are so tied into the particularities, a person and place, you know, just like everything else to do with the way that the faith is lived out, you know, uh, it, you know, God puts you in a concrete place in a context, you know, that is like, <laughs> that he's willed for you. And it's like the, the beauty of your life, the beauty of your life and, and your path to, to sanctity, hopefully is coming out of that. And, and that's the kind of thing that, um, film as a, as a medium is particularly suited to express. And, and, you know, the fact that it's, it's seen by so many as simply an industrial, you know, sort of like monolithic, this, this over culture, like this, you know, we only have one culture now, like we only have one pop star now, like it's crazy. But just, I can't believe how much has even changed in the last few years, just in the sense of like, you know, the one, just, just, there's only one thing of every type now, you know, um, Romare is a great example. I think in some ways, and I don't want to put, I don't want to put too much weight on his shoulders, but like he's, he to me is the example of like how a Catholic filmmaker may can not only survive, but thrive within the con embracing particular context and embracing kind of the humility with, with humility, embracing the, the modesty of one's situation and, and, you know, really diving into the, um, the quest of the soul, essentially, not the quest of like the big expensive production, you know, that is going to like really impress people because it looks like a real film. Uh, mm-hmm. You know, it's like, no, no, the real, the real, the real thing that we're trying to get for is like, can be had actually much more easily, but at the same time, much more difficult because obviously it's, it's, it's hard to see for, for many. So yeah, and let's uh, maybe just to wrap up. I uh, I, I want to emphasize that whereas a it is very well worth people's time to watch Andrei Tarkovsky movies or Carl Theodore Dreyer movies or whatever, those are very difficult movies for the most mm-hmm. part. Romare movies, in my opinion, are not difficult in that same way. They are they they're not at all like American movies, but they are accessible. I mean, you can really mm-hmm. put one on and you can you can get it. I mean, so. I think for my part, I agree with you, Nathan. I mean, Romare is really just about probably my favorite director. Um, and I, I I think maybe one of the reasons why is I I get what he's doing, even though the more I watch his movies, the more I get out of them. So I, I just couldn't recommend him enough. And maybe we'll just end with this. We've already talked about a bunch of Romare films, so you may want to pick one of the ones we've already talked about. But if you had to recommend one Romare film to our listeners who aren't familiar with his work, where would you tell them to start? It's always um, my night at mods uh, for, for Catholics, certainly for Catholic listeners, I would say, I would say for anybody, but, but particularly for Catholics that that kind of has to be the gateway one, I think, because it's so it's, it's just, it's very easy to connect to. Um, uh, yeah. But with that said, I think, um, Another film that is also for me, my, my first Romare film was actually the green ray. Um, and I think that is a, f- th- th- that is an accessible film, I think to connect to, I think uh, many of his films from the eighties, you could grab any at random. Uh, actually, you know what? I'll say this, um, his film, the aviator's wife, I think it's harder to find in North America. So this may not be, you know, the, the one for a lot of people, but, uh, that's an amazing film because it, it's, uh, it's 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 oh gosh how do i how do i say this uh it's it shows a great example of him taking kind of like the the things that fertilized his imagination uh in this case it's it's alfred hitchcock we haven't talked about his love for alfred hitchcock but basically you know he loved howard hawks and he loved alfred hitchcock uh among other other american filmmakers the aviator's wife is a is a simple s- story of a a guy who's kind of jealous his girlfriend he thinks his girlfriend is seeing like um 
an aviator, a, a, a pilot. Uh, and so the film is him kind of like trying to stake out her place and then kind of like follow around, like trying to see what's going on here. And then, you know, eventually can um, get the truth from her about like what's going on. Uh, and that, that may sound very mundane, but it's the whole thing. When you really break it down, it's, it's kind of a Hitchcock concept. You know, it's like he's search, he's, he's, this is surveillance and he's like, kind of stalking this person and, and um, there's a disappearance, you know, anyway, that's maybe not a great, a great selling job, but um, there is such a uh, vitality, I guess I would say in um, simple situations. But what I'm trying to get to is simplicity. Mm -hmm. uh, a film like the aviator's wife or the green ray, there's such a simplicity to them uh, that I think they're very easy to connect to because they don't take a lot to like kind of grasp what's going on. Um, but then once you're, once you're in, you're in, you know, yeah. like once you're hooked into like, what's the, what's the real quest here? Like you, you have to find out what happens there. They're, and so, um, yeah, I don't know. Uh, but the, the bottom line is like whatever Romero film you end up watching, I feel like unlike some other directors, I think he had so many strong films that you really can't go wrong. You know, and mm -hmm. um, all I can say is if it doesn't do the trick for you, then watch another one, you know? Yeah, um, totally keep, agree. Keep going. So. On, that note, on that note, excuse me, Nathan Douglas, thank you so much for taking the time to join us today. We'll have you back real soon. Thanks, guys. It was a real treat. For our listeners and viewers, uh, please don't forget to uh, like this episode, to share it, to check out our website, spacealbeinstitute.com, sign up for our emails, and until next time, God bless and live in hope.